Um, my name is Mary Jo Bain. Uh, I am the Thornton Bradshaw Professor of Public Policy and Management at the Harvard Kennedy School. I am currently Academic Dean, but will be stepping down uh, as Academic Dean in two weeks, one day, ten hours, but who's counting? I was born in Princeville, Illinois, which is a small town uh, near Peoria. Uh, both my parents are from Illinois, my father from Springfield, my mother from uh, from Princeville. Uh, we moved around a fair amount when I was a kid because uh, my dad was uh, working for the government and, and changing jobs. I spent most of my grade school years just outside of uh, Buffalo, New York. Uh, I graduated from high school just outside of Royal Oak, Michigan. When I was growing up, it was, uh, it was before Vatican II, so uh, uh, the Catholic Church was uh, still pretty uh, old-fashioned and, and rigid. I mean, I think what I got from Catholic schools, certainly though, uh, was a was a pretty good education. I mean, it wasn't wildly intellectual, uh, but uh, certainly got a, a commitment to uh, uh, issues of justice uh, and uh, issues of, uh, of of morality, and and that was a big part of my my growing up. Uh, certainly urged to uh, uh, be of service to others and and that was one of the main things that uh, uh, that my family was was committed to my family was was uh, quite devout Catholics uh, as I was at the time uh, and um, it was an important it was a very important piece of my growing up and Catholic Church remains an important piece of my life I graduated from high school in 1959. Uh, I w did my undergraduate at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown. Uh, so I was in Washington at Georgetown uh, between 1959 and 1963. Graduated from uh, from college in 1963. So I was in Washington and at Georgetown uh, during the time that uh, uh, John F. Kennedy was running for president and the first years of his presidency, which was obviously an important uh, uh, piece of uh, uh, piece of what was going on at the time. I think that had a very big impact. Uh, John F. Kennedy, of course, was the uh, was the first Catholic uh, elected president, uh, and that was important uh, for uh, certainly for for Georgetown. Many of my friends and I, you know, did work on his campaign. Uh, we uh, trudged through the snow to be uh, uh, be on hand at his inauguration. You know, kind of too far away to hear the speech, uh, but certainly observed the uh, uh, the parade. And I think his. You know, I mean, his call uh, to, uh, to to young people to public service it was just a very important part of of my growing up. I mean, the Peace Corps was just established in those years. Uh, he was talking about uh, and and modeling for people a commitment to public service in a in a new way. It seemed like a, a new time in the world and a and a time to be involved uh, with the issues of of peace and justice and kind of all the things that we were concerned about at that time. On graduation, you indeed went into the. Peace I went into the Peace Corps. That is correct. Um, I went to I went to Liberia uh, in West Africa. The Peace Corps had been established for about two years when I joined, so we weren't the first. You know, we weren't the first cohort, but we were a very early cohort. Um, we were a large cohort when going to to Liberia. The the Peace Corps had grown very rapidly in those first couple of years, and and so there were uh, there were there were many of us going to Liberia. I have a feeling that my uh, uh, assignment to Liberia was based uh, uh, somewhat on my uh, performance on the language aptitude to test. Um, Liberia is an English-speaking country, uh, at least uh, in the schools and, and so on. Uh, but it's a, you know, a fascinating, fascinating place. I hadn't I hadn't traveled abroad uh, during growing up or, or even during college. Um, in fact, I'm not even sure I'd been to the West Coast. Uh, and so going to Liberia, going to the Peace Corps was really my first experience of being in a different culture and away from uh, the roots of uh, family and friends and neighborhood and, and so on. And 
you know, the Peace Corps kind of challenges you to do things that you never thought you'd be able to do and live in a very different place. And it was it was a very, very important uh, part of my, um, you know, my early experience. Um, I was, I, most of the time that I was in Liberia, I lived in, in Cape Palmas. Uh, Cape Palmas is on the far uh, eastern end of Liberia, on the coast, so it's almost on the Ivory Coast border. Uh, you would describe it as a medium-sized town. I mean, it was a it was a real place. It wasn't a uh, it wasn't an isolated village. It had a high school, and I taught in the in the high school. Uh, it was also the birthplace of uh, William Vicanarek Shadrach Tubman, who was the president of Liberia at the time and had been president for I don't know. 30, 30 years, I think, at the time, and was president for twenty more. So um, it was a it was a place that uh, uh, he took some interest in, and, and uh, uh, so there was, as I say, there was a high school, and there were there were other other amenities. Though there was not, in fact, a road. Uh, you had to get to Cape Palmas um, either by boat going down the coast, or there was a plane. I think there was a plane twice a week that came in and brought mail and people. And I hadn't figured out when I went in the Peace Corps what I what I wanted to do, and uh, was assigned to teach, and that seemed fine. Uh, my mother had been a teacher, but I hadn't thought about being a teacher myself. Uh, but it was certainly something that I enjoyed, and uh, something that uh, seemed like a very it seemed like you were making a contribution, especially in a place like Liberia, where uh, helping kids understand the world and improve their skills and so on was important. So, from the Peace Corps, um, I. I applied to the uh, Master of Arts in Teaching program uh, here at Harvard to the to the Graduate School of Education. Uh, since I figured out that uh, I might as well be a teacher and uh, I sh should probably learn a little bit about how to do it. I applied to several other places as well. I think the reason I came to Harvard is that Harvard sent its acceptance letter by airmail rather than by uh, boat, uh, and so I actually got it uh, in in Liberia uh, and came then, as I say, to do a to do a master's uh, in teaching at at the School of Education. Did that uh, and then uh, taught seventh and eighth grade for several years uh, here in Massachusetts in in Brookline, uh, and then went back to the School of Education, got a doctorate in education. Uh, and I, I continued teaching while I was while I was uh, getting my doctorate, and then after I finished my doctorate, I started working with Christopher Jenks, uh, doing research on education policy, uh, and did that for a couple of years, and then uh, taught at Wellesley College for a couple of years, where I was also the uh, deputy director of the Center for Research on Women. Uh, and then came back to the School of Education in, I don't know, something like 1977 uh, as, a, as a member of the faculty of the, of the School of Education. I mean, teaching seventh and eighth grade is really hard work. Uh, so, you know, at some point you feel like there ought to be an easier way to make a living. Um, I also think that uh, some, of the, um, uh, some of the people that I had studied with at the, at the School of Education, particularly Don Oliver, uh, who was there at the time, he's now uh, passed away, uh, encouraged me to think about getting a doctorate and, and helping me get into the, into the doctoral program. I think they thought that uh, I might be able to, to uh, uh, either take an administrative position in education, since the doctorate was preparation for that, or possibly do research. And then I ended up, as I say, working with, working with Christopher Jenks, and that kind of was the way that I started moving into the, into the uh, research direction. Must have been around April of 1980, March or April of 1980, the Department of Education was just being formed. The Department of Health and Health Education and Welfare was being split into two departments, one of which was the uh, Department of Education and then and then uh, HEW became HHS. And um, I had gotten in the in the course of being at the School of Education. I had gotten to know some people. Uh, I suppose primarily Frank Keppel was the important one that I had gotten to know at the School of Education. And so when the 
Department of Education was uh, being put together, uh, I was invited to uh, come and, and be a Deputy Assistant Secretary uh, for Planning and Budget in the Department of Education. So I did that. Uh, and it was it was a it was a terrific experience. It was really my first experience in in government, and because the department was uh, just being formed, uh, we were setting up a lot of the new systems and kind of figuring out the budget for the first time and putting in place some of the evaluation processes and and so on. So. Uh, I, I learned a lot, and uh, the secretary at the time was Shirley Huffstedler, uh, who was uh, who was a real a real model. She had come uh, to the department from being a judge, uh, someone that I very very much admired, and and so being able to work in that environment, as I say, I learned a lot both about education policy, but also about how government worked and, uh, and about how to um, make things happen. Now, um, it was 1980, and uh, there was an election in, in 1980, and, and Jimmy Carter was, was running for re-election, and we had, of course, all been appointed uh, uh, by the Carter administration. Uh, and um, he was running against Ronald Reagan. And uh, Ronald Reagan won pretty decisively. Uh, it was interesting. We. I, I think kind of kidded ourselves uh, up until the very time of the election that Carter actually had a chance to uh, win that election, uh, but it was um, it, it was a real it was a real landslide. So by November, I can't remember the date that year, November sixth or seventh. Uh, it was clear that um, I needed to think about what the next stage was going to be because I obviously wasn't uh, going to be staying as a as a political appointee. Actually, it, it, it turned out that uh, I came to the school the same year that the city and regional planning program from the School of Design uh, was being brought over and made part of the Kennedy School. And that program did have two women, uh, Julie Wilson and, and Sonny Ladd. Uh, and so I was not the absolutely only woman. Uh, and of course, Edith Stokey uh, was, uh, was the secretary to the school at that time, uh, and obviously somebody who was a, a very important person. And I think Edith really uh, helped me understand the school and helped me get uh, adjusted to what I was, uh, what, what I was teaching and, and doing. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, it was, it was clear that uh, uh, women were making slow inroads at the Kennedy School and other places at Harvard, but that, you know, inroads were being made. So it, it, didn't, it didn't seem like a... Uh, terrible barrier to overcome. Now I was probably pretty oblivious uh, uh, in in some ways because cer you know people certainly did welcome me uh, and the people that I was working with, Larry Lynn and Neith Stokey, and that was actually when I met David Elwood. And I met David Elwood because uh, I was assigned to an office which is was near to the office he had. He had started in the fall of 1980, and I came in January of 1981, and we were also assigned to the same uh, faculty assistant. Uh, so we interacted with each other across the desks of our uh, fa shared faculty assistant. Uh, and, um, the, you know, he, he talked about the research that he was doing, and I talked about the things that I wanted to do, and that was really when we started, uh, started working together, and we have worked together ever since. I taught statistics. Um, they, that first semester, they needed somebody to uh, teach the required statistics course in the, in the city and regional planning program, so I did that. Uh, and I taught a course, I think I taught a course on educational policy that first year. So I did those things. And then the next year, I think it was the second year, and for several years thereafter, uh, I taught the course that was known at the time uh, as P150, the workshop course. Uh, that was a required course for the MPPs, uh, wh which was, it was taught in three sections, I guess. Uh, but it was a case course and kind of policy making and skills and all that sort of thing. So uh, David worked in that course as well. Larry Lynn worked in that course. So we, uh, it, it was a, uh, it was a very interesting, uh, interesting experience to, you know, to try to make that course work and develop some new cases for it and so on. So I taught that course. I taught statistics occasionally. Uh, I taught um, educational policy. Um, I started teaching.
teaching. David and I taught a course on kind of human services policy uh, together. Uh, I taught uh, some courses on the on the kind of budgeting side. I, you know, I did a lot of different things when, when different things were needed in those early years. For me, having had the experience in the Department of Education and then having the opportunity to teach and continue learning and developing cases and, and uh, continuing research work uh, was something that uh, I think enriched uh, both my teaching and uh, helped me think about what the things that I wanted to do next were. I then had a, in the mid-1980s, had a, another uh, a, a experience of being able to go into government. Uh, I was um, invited to become the executive deputy commissioner of the New York State Department of Social Services. Uh, that was uh, based in Albany, uh, and the department was the uh, state department that had responsibility for the welfare programs, for uh, Medicaid payments and eligibility, for child welfare services, child protection, a very large department, uh, several billion dollars even at the, even at the time. Uh, uh, governor Cuomo, Mario Cuomo was, was governor, uh, the commissioner was uh, named Cesar Perales, uh, who was a, a very good person to work with. In, in, and in that, that was a very interesting and important job for me because that job was a more operational job than the one I had in Washington. The job I had in Washington was in a planning and evaluation office, or it was called planning and budget in the in the department, which is basically a staff job. And you know, you're you're doing staff work, you're uh, working on policy and so on. But in the in the uh, uh, Department of Social Services, I you know I had to worry about things like whether people were answering the hotline through which people were reporting child abuse and whether doctors were getting paid under the Medicaid program on time. Uh, so there was a lot of operational work uh, and just kind of overseeing the operations of the department. And again, that was quite a new experience for me. Making the shift from kind of thinking about education to thinking about poverty and, and social services was actually not a very big shift, and partly it was it was it began I, I would say when uh, Christopher Jenks and I worked together on uh, uh, the 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 inequality book, and uh, that book, which was a, had many co-authors of of which I was one, but but Sandy Sandy Jenks was the was certainly the the major author. Uh, that book tried to look at the role that education played in generating and, and perpetuating inequality and poverty, and um, concluded that education was probably not as important as the family backgrounds of children and the and the other experiences they had when they were growing up and i think that uh, to some extent that that insight, which of course you get when you're teaching school too, uh, which is the importance of the of the environments that the children are in, uh, it kind of shifted me a little bit towards the towards the social services end, uh, and then you know the opportunity to um, uh, to go to the social services department in New York was uh, was the first time that I. Uh, you know that I had a government job in the social services field, uh, but was and and was the time that I really kind of started uh, learning more about all the not only the policy issues but the operational issues in the, in that realm. Well, people were starting to think about the issues that uh, preoccupied everybody for the next uh, decade or so in in terms of whether one could uh, make the welfare system more less of a uh, less of a long-term safety net for people and more of an opportunity for them to uh, get training uh, to uh, get some help in getting back into the workforce and Governor Cuomo was very interested in trying to do what he could in New York uh, uh, to make some of those moves in the in the welfare system and he put together a um, uh, 
kind of cross-agency commission uh, to look at the welfare system in, in New York, and I think I was co-chairing that probably with a person from, from his staff, and we brought together people to think about it and look at, look at the various pieces, uh, primarily looking at, at work and looking at, at child support. So uh, we were able to, you know, we were able to do some, some interesting things in New York, and I think uh, the federal, uh, one of the major federal pieces of welfare legislation was in 1988, the, the uh, Family Support Act that, that Senator Moynihan uh, was the uh, prime sponsor of, and I think that kind of thinking uh, was what was going on in, in welfare at that time. The first paper uh, we did together, the first research project we did together, was on the on the dynamics of poverty, and then shortly thereafter on the dynamics of welfare. And what we did was a uh, was an analytic piece, uh, which looked at how long people were poor and and kind of how people tended to become poor and move out of poverty. And um, people paid a lot of attention to that because that work in that particular paper because um, mostly when people thought about poverty, they thought about it as a static state. So you would look at the numbers on poverty and you would say, you know, 15 percent of the population is, is counted as poor or 12 percent is counted as poor, and you kind of thought about that as, as 12 percent of the population. Uh, you know, when you think about it a little bit longer, you realize that, that for many people that's a, a temporary state, and people become poor and move out of poverty. And David and I did a fair amount of analysis on that and, you know, kind of identified the fact and uh, tried to work through the fact that um, a lot of poverty really was quite short term. People fell on hard times for one reason or another and then were able to get out. Uh, but for many people, um, not a huge percentage overall, but a large percentage at any given point, uh, were kind of stuck in poverty for long periods of time. And so that got us thinking about um, how, you, how policy might respond to, uh, uh, to that fact that there was, uh, that people came in and out and that what you, what your systems ought to be trying to do was to kind of prevent people from coming in and, and get them out and into a better situation in a, in a shorter period of time. Uh, and, and so uh, we did a similar kind of analysis with regard to the welfare system. You see the same things. People, a lot of people use it as, as used it as kind of short term, um, but then there were, there were long term uh, long-term recipients. So uh, I would say that that uh, thread uh, of our uh, of our work was a was a major one. Uh, and then we, you know, you kind of started thinking about well, you know, kind of what are the reasons that lead people to come in and go off, and what can you do to speed those up, and what kind of a work system could you put in place, and at the same time that you're uh, providing the 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 safety net, uh, especially for people who needed to get over a get over a rough patch uh, or a, or a hard time in their life. So I'd say those that was the that was the major the major thrust of our work and and as you say uh, that carried on for um, uh, un until uh, in uh, 1993 both David and I uh, went to Washington uh, as part of the Clinton administration. I had gone back to New York in um, 1992 uh, as commissioner of social services. I had been deputy commissioner, went back as, as uh, commissioner, uh, but um, only held that position for about a year, a little over a year, uh, because uh, President Clinton, Donna Shalala, his Secretary of Health and Human Services, uh, wanted both David and I to, to uh, join the Department of Health and Human Services as uh, part of the welfare reform team. So uh, that was my next adventure in Washington. The politics of welfare were, were very different. I mean, it was, it was a very interesting time. When we, when we went into the administration, um, President Clinton was committed to doing welfare reform and doing it in a way that was both oriented towards work but also um, also humane and I think David and I saw it as a as an opportunity to help work on legislation that would um, you know kind of in, increase the focus on work increase the focus on child support uh, focus on the kinds of things that would uh, both provide some incentives for people to get off 
welfare and into the labor market and and also um, uh, provide the supports that that they would they would need to do it uh, the administration at the time was was also working and David worked on this though though I I didn't work on this piece uh, on expanding the earned income tax credit which was a very important kind of complement to what we were doing on on welfare because the earned income tax credit was designed to uh, to provide income support to low wage workers so that people could support their families even if they were working at a at a relatively low wage and that made it much more possible for uh, people to move into the labor market especially especially single moms who couldn't always work full time uh, uh, and so on the administration was also working on uh, on health care reform uh, which uh, uh, turned out to be uh, sort of a debacle. I think everybody everybody agreed that uh, uh, that, that that was uh, uh, that turned out that turned out quite quite badly. But anyway, during the during the first two years of the Clinton administration, uh, we were working very hard on on welfare reform, and other parts of the administration were working on uh, health policy reform as well. I guess I should also say that. Um, David and I had had quite different jobs in the department. David was uh, in the planning and evaluation office, and so he was doing uh, his responsibility was the analytic work, the evaluation work, and and so on. I participated in that, but mainly I was running the offices that actually did the work. Uh, I was running the the. Uh, uh, Office of uh, the Administration for Children and Families, which had responsibility for running the welfare programs and running the child support system and running Head Start and and so on. So I spent a lot of my time uh, in that job as I had in in my job in New York, just kind of worrying about worrying about operations and worrying about uh, uh, making things uh, making things work. And and one of my roles in the in the welfare reform process was always asking the question of, you know, well, how, do, how would we make this work? Uh, could people actually do this? Is this something that you can, you, you can imagine, you, you can imagine doing? And so uh, we were a nice, you know, we were a nice complement to each other in, in, that, in that sense. Uh, then in uh, 1994, um, uh, the congressional elections of, of 1994 uh, were a huge defeat for the Democrats, and the Democrats had controlled the Senate and the House before that, and lost both the Senate and the House, and badly, I mean very badly. Uh, and a good part of the analysis was that um, uh, health care reform, had, uh, the attempt at health care reform uh, had, been a, had been a big mistake, uh, and uh, really backfired. In terms of in terms of the politics, uh, and so uh, you know after the after the congressional election in in 1994, and then the uh, the Republicans had control of the welfare reform agenda, and they had their own uh, ideas about welfare reform, which from my point of view and and from the point of view of many in the administration were uh, much more um, were much less humane than the approach that we had. Wanted to take. Uh, they were uh, they were um, arguing for very strict uh, time limits on welfare. They were arguing for things like not not increasing welfare benefits when people had additional children, uh, strict work requirements, and so on. So uh, at that point, our efforts became, I would say, more of a uh, uh, you know kind of more of attempt to uh, make it turn out uh, better than the Republicans were. Uh, Trying to put in place. I left the administration in um, September of 1996 uh, after the president uh, signed the welfare reform bill. Um, I thought he should not have signed the welfare reform bill. Uh, I thought that uh, the a couple of features of the bill, as it had been passed. Uh, were going to uh, do a fair amount of harm uh, uh, to poor people, uh, especially uh, the feature of the of the bill that block granted uh, the money to the states uh, and gave the states much more uh, freedom and, and flexibility to use that money. And then I also I also felt that uh, the way that the time limits in the in the bill had been designed were were much too harsh. Um, the president uh, decided to. Uh, the president decided to sign the bill. Um, you know, 
half politics. Uh, it was just before the re-election of 1996, and I think he didn't want to, you know, kind of spend the whole campaign uh, trying to explain why he had vetoed a welfare reform bill. So he he did sign the bill, uh, and uh, several of us at that point, Peter Edelman and myself and and Wendell Primus, uh, left the administration and and did so saying that we were we were leaving over the welfare bill. Um, anyway, I suppose I came back, um, you know, kind of uh, understanding much more about the politics, uh, kind of still kind of committed to those issues. You know, also I had obviously burned a lot of bridges in Washington, so um, uh, the, you know, the kind of relationship that many faculty members have, and to some extent that I had before, uh, before this time, uh, was um, uh, was no longer. Uh, though President Clinton was was very gracious about our leaving, as was as was uh, as was Donna Shalala. Uh, so I came back, and you know, I mean, I guess I was a a, a little bit. You know, kind of unsure as to what kinds of uh, things I would do. Although I did, I did, did continue uh, working on on those kinds of issues. I, I also at that time started uh, becoming a little more interested in the role that faith communities had played in the welfare debates, and that were con kind of continuing to play in. Uh, discussions in the country about uh, issues related to poverty and issues related to justice, and so uh, you know, started working. There was a project going on where a group of faculty were were looking at the role that the faith communities had played, and I ended up writing a paper for that and becoming more interested in in that set of issues, and was actually able to spend one year, it was 1998 or something like that, um, uh, had a sabbatical. Um, uh, and was able to spend some time at the Divinity School uh, working on that set of issues, but also, um, you know, kind of learning uh, in that in that regard. So uh, it was just a little, you know, I mean, again, everything is uh, that I've done is related in many ways, and that was just a branching out in a little bit of a different way. Uh, at various points along the way, uh, I have been was the chair of the public policy program for. Uh, two years probably. I was the chair of the mid-career program for a couple of years. Uh, I was a cluster chair for uh, what was then called domestic policy and then for uh, management leadership and then, as you know, I've been academic dean for the last five years. So, uh, you know, I've been on, I suppose I've been at some point or other on most of the committees <laughs> that the school has. Uh, I think I've been on all the admissions committees and, and so on. But yeah, I've done a lot of, I've done a fair amount of administration. Well, I think the you know, you know the the major things that we did uh, during the time that I've been academic dean and and that and that David started was really to establish the area structure. Uh, before we established the area structure, uh, we had about 120 full-time equivalent faculty, and they all reported to the academic dean. Uh, and you know that seemed like kind of not the best uh, managerial strategy. Uh, and, and so uh, David asked the committee to kind of figure out a way to structure, and we established the areas. And, and making the areas work, I think, has been a has been an important uh, and important contribution. And you know the the areas are not. Um, uh, they are similar to departments in a faculty of arts and sciences, but they don't have hiring authority. Uh, hiring authority is still done at the at the school as a as a whole. Uh, but uh, they enabled us to, you know, kind of provide better environments for uh, junior faculty coming in and kind of a little more coherence in the curriculum and so on. So I would say that uh, getting that in place and working with the area chairs to make it work and, and kind of thinking about that is, is, is something important. And I think we also got a little more systematic at looking at the composition of our faculty and the mix of Academics from different disciplines, with people uh, from with backgrounds in practice uh, that that come in with a uh, with a different background. I think I think one of the great strengths of the faculty at the at the Kennedy School is that uh, that is that we do have uh, on the faculty people who uh, who have spent their entire career in uh, doing research and and teaching in a university, and we have people who have spent most of their career being in practice, and we have and people like. Are actually not all that common on the on the faculty. I mean, I probably spent 
over the years, eight or nine years, in, in public service of one kind or another, that's relatively unusual. Um, you know, most people, some people will go and, as David did, for example, spend two years uh, uh, in, a, in a job, or as, as Jeff Liebman did, uh, or as Larry Summers did. Um, uh, but but as a as a whole, you know, the faculty uh, does bring a very rich mix of uh, disciplinary expertise and uh, experience in public practice, and I think that's one of the great strengths of the place. And I I uh, like to feel like uh, during this time that I've been academic dean, we've become a little more kind of systematic in thinking about that, and a little more conscious of making sure we keep those keep those balances and, and try to work them as best we can. I guess the other thing that I, um, I feel some, uh, uh, some pride in is the establishment of SLATE, which is our initiative. Uh, uh, SLATE stands for Strengthen, Teaching, uh, Strengthen Learning and Teaching Excellence. Uh, and um, we really put that initiative together uh, in order to focus on teaching and to help faculty to try to improve their teaching, to bring attention to the fact that good teaching is important and, and help people to do it. So we were able to, uh, to bring in a teaching coach. Uh, we were able to run faculty seminars around teaching and, and, and that sort of thing. And, and, I, and I think that, that, that for me, um, teaching in a professional school, which obviously we are, has to be different from teaching in an in, in arts and sciences department because our teaching as, as uh, in, a, in a professional school really has to be focused on solving problems in the real world. Um, we are not about uh, the theoretical problems of the disciplines. We are about bringing knowledge and bringing skills to solving real problems in the world, whether they be economic problems or political problems or substantive problems or, or problems of international relations. And, and in order to do a good job of that, uh, we, have to, we have to teach the specific skills well. We have to teach economics well, we have to teach statistics well, we have to teach politics well, we have to teach uh, substantive uh, issues well, we have to teach management well, but we also have to provide students with um, opportunities to bring those skills together in uh, applying them to real problems in the, in the world. Um, and we, you know, I mean, I think that's a continuing challenge for the school and, and one that I know people will be working on for, for years to come. Uh, one good example of what we do is, is spring exercise for the, the first year MPPs. Uh, it comes at the end of the spring semester of the, of the first year and kind of the students basically spend pretty much full time for two weeks working on a, on a particular problem and, and you know, kind of in all its messiness kind of trying to figure out how you, how you understand it. But I think part of what we were trying to do with, with Slate is uh, give people the incentives and the materials and some of the skills to be able to do more integrated and applied things in their classrooms to do more integrated and applied things during the January term to kind of figure out how we can how, how we can really uh, meet the meet the needs of the students to uh, to have things uh, applied very uh, concretely and to, to real world problems so um, yeah I, I spent a lot of time worrying about that uh, and and kind of trying to think about what we can do to improve that kind of stuff uh, it seems to me the school has become much more international and I think uh, for me the biggest change that I noticed in the school when I came back uh, from from Washington in in the late 1990s was how international the school was now you know it had been international before and maybe I just didn't notice it or wasn't teaching in the classes where the international students were but certainly when I came back uh, the diversity uh, the diversity of countries that people came from and of perspectives that they brought were really very striking and and um, I began to think about how 
my own teaching, uh, when I was teaching about poverty or when I was teaching about public management, both of which I, was, I have been doing for, for many years, uh, how to respond to these different, uh, the different needs of, of, different, of different students, you know, kind of learning how to teach cases from different countries, uh, look at material from, from different countries, I would say that is, a, that, is a, that is a big change. I would say that our students are very demanding, um, whether they are more demanding now than they used to be. I I don't know, uh, but they are they are uh, demanding, and I think rightfully so. I mean, they are. Uh, this is this is a expensive place for people to come, not just in terms of the uh, the cash that they have to pay for for tuition and, and being here, but for the time that they take out from their from their careers. And so, while they are here, they want to. Uh, get the most out of the place. I mean, they want to. They want to learn the skills. They want to get the knowledge uh, that they need in order to to go back and and do their job. So so they are demanding, uh, and um, I think that you know we as a faculty need to keep trying to understand that. And and you know not that the students are always right, uh, but that. Uh, Recognizing that we do have an obligation to uh, teach as well as we can, to help them learn as well as we can, uh, is is something that you know, we need to we need to be really very uh, responsive to. The, part of, part of the challenge is to is to help build a community of faculty, which is a community committed to uh, the work of the school, uh, the larger work of the school of, of uh, teaching and research and, and outreach and really focusing together on, on, on that. And part of the reason that is a, that is a challenge is that um, faculty members are uh, selected by and large and select themselves uh, into being faculty members because they are interested in the life of the mind and they like to do research, and they often like to do it by themselves. Thank you very much. Uh, though more and more, I would say people people do it together. But you know, a school and an institution committed to making an impact in the world uh, needs to be more than just the sum of all its individual faculty members. It needs to uh, have a curriculum that makes sense, and it needs to have a curriculum that's more integrated, and so on. And so I think the, you know, the biggest challenges come in trying to um, you know, to to respect and uh, appreciate and and support the individual work of faculty members and their need to have time to do research and to continue contributing to the uh, to the intellectual life of the world and the and the knowledge of the world, but at the same time to uh, uh, to work together on um, on on teaching, on interacting with the students, and on uh, some of the on executive education, on some of the the projects of the of the school. So, uh, you know, the academic gene job is a lot of uh, a lot of individual problem solving, but you know, kind of always trying to keep in mind these uh, these larger issues of where we should be going. Yeah, and I guess I would say that that's another big change that I've observed uh, over the over the time that I've been here has been the uh, growth in uh, ex executive education as a major part of the of the school. I mean, we are now, as you know, uh, have executive education programs that bring in something like three thousand students every year uh, uh, in one program or another. And I mean, if you just look at kind of our total teaching activity. Um, depends a little bit on how you count, but if you try to look at our total teaching activity, executive education is now about a quarter of our total teaching activity. And I would say that uh, the change that has taken place in the last decade, probably a little less than that, because it really um, I mean, it really started when Chris Letts uh, took over the direction of executive education, though it started a little bit before that. She's really been remarkable. I hope you'll talk to her. Um, uh, I mean, the change has been from thinking about executive education as kind of an add-on that's sort of nice to have and brings in some cash to the school, to executive education as an integral part of the mission of the school. And I think the reason that that it is so important to the mission is, you know, kind of when you think about it, uh, the people that 
come to executive education programs, and in, in many of our degree programs, we are selecting students and training them because we believe that they have the potential to become leaders in government or leaders in international organizations or leaders in nonprofit organizations, and we are we are betting on them and betting on their future. Uh, when people come to executive education, we already know uh, that they are uh, in important positions in government, important positions in other sectors of, of, of public service. They are, uh, they are really in the positions where they can directly uh, make a difference on some of, the most important, some of the most important problems in the world. And I think once you recognize that and you say, oh, gee, uh, this is really an important part of our mission and how can we do as good a job as possible in designing programs and selecting students for those programs in teaching those programs and integrating them into the school uh, uh, that 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 you see that it really is an important part of the part of the mission and I think there is uh, I, I think now that that is very much very much recognized I mean my own you know, I've been involved over the years not as much as as many people have but I've taught in a number of executive education uh, programs um, I've uh, taught in programs in China, I've taught in programs in, in India, taught in, uh, in kind of some of the programs for government officials here, so I, I know a fair amount about uh, about executive education and executive education teaching. And it really is a, uh, those programs really do provide, a, I would say, a remarkable opportunity for the school to extend its reach to, um, you know, kind of deal with students who are at very high levels and, and who are in a position to have real impact on the world. I think as an executive education teacher, even more than as a, a teacher in degree programs, you have to see yourself as a facilitator of learning uh, as much as an imparter of learning. I mean, oftentimes we are trying to teach them some skills and we've got some expertise in that and when you put together a program you, you try to bring that in. But, but much of the learning that goes on in executive education uh, comes from the interaction of the students with each other and and with the professor. So much of the teaching that is done in an executive education is, is case-based teaching, is teaching that, uh, that uh, helps people uh, bring their own learnings to bear and, 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 and share them with each other. So it's, uh, uh, it's challenging and, you know, frankly, it helps if you've had some experience in government yourself. Uh, it gives you a little more credibility, though it's not necessary. And many of our very, very good executive education teachers have not uh, have not uh, had have not had that kind of experience, but um, obviously uh, need to bring into the into the classroom uh, uh, something that gives them credibility. Uh, but I, it's a it's a challenging and interesting experience. Yeah, well, I'm not sure, and I figure it'll take a little time to uh, to figure it out. Um, I have over the years uh, uh, been quite interested in in. Uh, in the problems of Haiti, and have been to Haiti several times, and uh, this year was one of the co-chairs of, of Spring Exercise uh, that dealt with the reconstruction of Haiti, and, and asked our students to uh, investigate and, and uh, do some thinking about the the issues involved in in, in reconstruction. And uh, partly growing out of that, and out of some other work that I'm doing, uh, one of the things that I know I'm going to be doing is is working on an executive education program uh, that we will do. Uh, for Haitians, almost certainly in Haiti, and and over the next uh, year, I hope to I hope to do that. Uh, I hope to uh, continue working on spring exercise because I think that's an that's an important piece. Uh, and then I want to think about kind of where my own uh, writing and and research is is going to go. I'm giving a couple of lectures this uh, July in at the University of San Francisco. Uh, they have a um, it's a Catholic university, and they have a center on on social justice. And I'm giving a couple of lectures on um, uh, Catholic social teachings and issues of poverty and, and welfare uh, and uh, services in the world, and we'll see if that uh, develops into into something uh, broader. But uh, you know, I figure I can take some time and and figure out what's most interesting to do and what opportunities come up. And um, part of my goal actually is to do less than I've been doing the last uh, at least the last five years.